Hey, good morning and welcome. Thanks for coming out today. Hey, in 1984, Pat Morita starred as Mr. Miyagi in the popular movie, The Karate Kid. Now, Mr. Miyagi was a karate master and Ralph Macchio played Daniel-san, the student. And there is a scene in which Mr. Miyagi has Daniel-san do a number of seemingly meaningless tasks. And it doesn't take long for Daniel to kind of feel like he's being taken advantage of. And so he complains to his sensei, his teacher. Now, Mr. Miyagi has Daniel show him wax on, wax off, right? He says, show me sand the floor, sand the floor, paint the fence, paint the fence. And it is not until this exchange that it becomes clear to Daniel that these defensive movements serve to have him become instinctively connected to these movements in his memory. And learning is a process. And good teachers will use whatever means they can to reach their desired outcomes. And Jesus is a rabbi, which means he is a teacher of the 613 laws of Moses, but he is also on a sacred mission. So today we're going to hear three stories. What I'd like you to do as you hear these stories is to ask yourself, what is G Jesus' desired outcome? Who are his students and what tool or tools does he use to make his point? Last week, we left Jesus feeling down and discouraged, both by the resistance of of some people to his message about the kingdom of God and because the empire had just had John the Baptist killed. And he's not willing to give up, but he seeks a private place to, so he, that he can go to so that he can regroup. And when Jesus arrives, he finds his, his attempt to find some alone time doesn't materialize. And he has compassion on the crowds and, that followed him. And so he heals the sick. And miraculously, he feeds a group of about 5,000 families. Well, after this, Jesus dismisses the crowds, and he sends his disciples away by boat so they can go up onto the mountain to be alone and to pray. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at our passage together. Lord, we are your gathered church, called and formed by you. As we open up your sacred text today, I pray that you would meet us in this place that we would hear from you, that you would be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to pick up our story today in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning in 24, verse 24, if you'd like to follow along. Where we read, Later that night, Jesus was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when his disciples saw that he was walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And Jesus immediately says to them, take courage, it's just me. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when he climbed back into the boat, the wind subsided. And those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. And when they reached the other side, Jesus continues to bring healing and restoration to the sick and to the afflicted. Now, turning the page to our second story, we begin to pick, we pick that one up in Chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Then some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders, and they don't wash their hands before they eat? And Jesus replied, Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother. But you say, and I like this translation from the Amplified Bible, I would have helped mom and dad, except for the money that I have has already been given to God. Now, remember that he is speaking to the Jewish leadership here. In essence, Jesus is asking, are you guys kidding me right now? Are you going to really hold the ceremonial cleanliness and ritually, ritual and purity laws of more importance than caring for your mom and your dad? What about what God says about desiring mercy rather than sacrifice? And all of this makes me want to ask, is there a place for ritual practice in the church? Well, there is, and we'll get to that in a bit. But Jesus continues, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
They worship me in vain. And Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, listen and understand, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile the person, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles the person. Now the disciples were concerned that they may have offended uh, the, the religious leadership, but they privately asked Jesus to explain. He says, are you still so dull? Don't you see that whatever goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth, they proceed from the heart. And these are what defiles them. For it's out of the heart comes every evil thought, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are the things that defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands? Yeah, not so much. All right, now for our third story. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to a region of Tyre and Sidon, and a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And Jesus didn't answer her a word at first. So the disciples came to him and said, send her away. She's kind of bothering us. But he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, she said, help me. And he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the, that fall from the master's table. And Jesus said to her, woman, you have a great faith. Your request has been granted. And that her daughter was healed that very moment. So what can we learn from these three stories? Well, clearly, there's a connection between Peter's attempt to walk on the water and the Canaanite woman pleading for Jesus to heal her sick daughter. Uh, and it has everything to do with our faith. Peter's lack of it and the woman's demonstration of it. Now, remember, we said last week that faith is progressive. And Jesus had run into a roadblock. People had heard his words and seen his deeds, including his disciples, and they just weren't getting it. So let's go back to our orienting questions. What do these miracles intend to do? And what did Jesus want his disciples to learn? Well, in the very next chapter, Jesus is going to ask Peter a very big question. Who do people say that I am? And you can see here that Jesus is narrowly focused on his inner circle. So why does Jesus walk on the water? Do we think that Jesus was just a big show off? Well, I'm going to go with no. I think Jesus was over explaining, if you will. And he is showing this. And, and how did his disciples respond? Well, at least for the moment, they seem to get it, saying, surely you are the son of God. Well, skipping for a moment Jesus' interaction with the Jewish Pharisees and giving our attention to the Canaanite woman, what's the deal with Jesus' hesitancy to heal this non-Jewish woman's daughter? I mean, Jesus has healed many non-Hebrews up until this point. Well, I'm going to suggest that Jesus was always intending to heal her, but he's using this as a teaching moment. And certainly this woman and her daughter are going to benefit from Jesus' mercy. But again, Who's his target audience? Well, I think it's his inner circle. He's doing this for the benefit of those as his closest disciples. Jesus wants them to, to reveal to them that he really is the Messiah that they've all been waiting for. And he has been demonstrating that the kingdom of heaven is at hand through these acts of mercy and grace right from the beginning. And in each of these scenes, Jesus demonstrates his authority as God's agent commissioned to bring God's saving presence and kingdom into the world. So how does this exchange with his religious leaders concerning the ceremonial cleanliness and ritual purity fit in? Well, why do we say that cleanliness is next to godliness? We do because we know that only God is pure and holy, that you and I have been made holy through Christ. Our holiness comes by association. And Jesus doesn't abolish the ceremonial hand washing or the purity concerns. He just stresses that they don't reveal a heart that's lived in full commitment to God's will. So is there a place for ritual and ceremony in the church today? I'm going to say yeah, because the physical informs the spiritual. And like Daniel and Mr. Miyagi, these practices are instructional and they ground us. They instill in us the things that our traditions teach. 
And they often use all of our senses, the sense of touch, smell, sight, and hearing. Take, for example, how the typical memorial service, which is used to remember those who we've lost, also demonstrates to us that a life, our life is not measured by our mortality. Or think about the marriage ritual, how it communicates covenant, it stresses fidelity, honor, and much more. Or how about the ritual of baptism, in which we identify with Christ through our, his death and his burial as we go under the water, and how we identify with Jesus as, in his resurrection as we come up out of the water as new creation. Or what about the Lord's Supper? How it is used to remind us of Jesus' willful and sacrificial act to, on our behalf to free us from sin and death, but also as a source of spiritual nourishment, anticipating the great feast that's promised at the end of the age, when Jesus will return, and when heaven and earth are formed together again into one finally fully realized kingdom, renewed and restored, and where we see Jesus sitting on the throne. These ritual observances provide us a way to live into our faith. But they do not supersede or override our obligations to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. It's important to understand that these rituals, these sacraments, are a means of grace, and that they are a way that we are to understand grace in the here and now. But they are not grace itself. The Lord's Supper and baptism, of course, are the good gift that Christ has left the church. And they hold us together. They provide us assurance of the promises that Jesus made, that he would one day return and bring salvation to its right and full conclusion. And after this, what does Jesus do? Well, he's, he's going to feed another large crowd of people, and this time almost exclusively comprised of non-Jews. And the scripture says that Jesus left there and he went along the Sea of Galilee. And then he went up to a mountainside and he sat down. And great uh, crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, and the mute, and many others. And they laid him at Jesus' feet, and he healed them all. These people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, and the crippled made well, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They've already been with me for three days, and they haven't eaten anything. And I don't want them to go away hungry. And his disciples answered, he said, where can we go and find enough bread in such a remote place to feed these people? Well, how many loaves do you have, he said. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. And he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke them. He gave them to his disciples, who in return gave them to the people. And all who ate were satisfied. And afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And the number of those who ate were 4,000 men, besides the women and the children. I mean, this is totally like a wash, rinse, and repeat, or a deja vu all over again moment, right? And what the disciples had failed to learn from their previous moment was they got to witness again. It's a total do-over. And what were they meant to learn? What was Jesus' objective in all of this? Well, let me ask you this. Who has the power to heal the sick? To forgive people of their sins? Who has the authority over the spirit realm? Who has the authority to control the wind and the waves? Jesus' actions reveal his identity. And even these non-Jewish followers, who had only been with Jesus for three days, they seem to have got it. And the scripture says that the people were amazed at what they saw, that the mute were speaking and the crippled were made well and the lame were walking and the blind saw, and they praised the God of Israel. They immediately understood and recognized Jesus' great authority. They did not have any preconceived ideas about what a Messiah was going to be like. They responded to what they had seen with their eyes, heard with their ears, and touched with their hands. All right, so what about us? What's our takeaway today? On what basis do we believe who Jesus is? Where does my faith come from? And how does the season of Lent play into, and the church calendar play into all of that? How can I be sure that I am not just giving lip service to my faith? And is there a difference between a reasoned faith and blind faith? 
Well, you and I, we don't have the advantage of Jesus' physical presence with us. But we are not left without any resources either. And the biggest resource that we have, of course, is the Holy Spirit. But besides the Holy Spirit, we have the biblical record. We have the apostolic witness. And we have the historical records that come from both Greek and Jewish sources. So what's the deal with the church calendar then, right? What were the fears of, of the early Christian community? Well, the fear was that the further removed people got from being able to see, hear, and touch, that many would lose their identity as believers through assimilation into the culture. And the church calendar is a tool that the church developed to come up with to help preserve the identity of the Christ followers by rehearsing the story of Jesus' life throughout the year, by weaving the the disciplines of prayer and fasting and repentance, self-denial and solitude into our ordinary lives. And then in addition to this practice, we've, we've also come up with some practical methodology conceived by a guy by the name of John Wesley in the 18th century, who was a pastor and a practical theologian. And he worked out what he called his quadrilateral, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Not scripture alone, and not experience or emotion alone. And his methodology, not all parts were equal. Quadrilateral did not mean equilateral. Scripture is the foundation. The inspired, the written word of God, it holds the most weight. And upon this foundation were the church traditions. These are the teachings that were passed down through the apostles and their disciples that were codified into the early creeds. They have been adopted into the church and they agree with the biblical text. And they also help us determine which practices are inconsistent with Scripture and to be discarded. And then comes reason. God expects us to use our brain with a good biblical practices in order to discern God's will. And finally, to Scripture, tradition, and reason, we add experience so that our experience can be used as a touchstone, a means by which we can share the reality of God's love with others. A life of faith is never an accident. You will never accidentally fall into faithfulness. It requires intentionality and discipline. And we need to rehearse these practices so that they become ingrained in our memory. Let's close in prayer. Lord, help us to be people of grace, people who can walk the paths of righteousness. Help us to be the reason that people turn to you in hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in love. Thanks for joining me today. God bless you. Go in peace. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. We sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy.
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. 